good to be in church today to hear God's word. Does anybody believe that God still speaks to us? Does anybody, did anybody come here today believing that maybe God's going to speak to you personally? This guy does. <laughs> the rest of you, we're going to hear what God has to say to this guy, all right? I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and just say, you were created for more. You were created for more. Now, I want you to repeat these words after me. This is what God says about you. As we've been looking at, as we've been working through the book of Ephesians, we looked through chapter one the past two weeks, and we've seen that God calls us certain things. Those of us who are followers of Jesus, he calls us certain things. Uh, one of those things is a saint. Now, now I, I grew up believing as a young child that a saint was someone that had passed on, that had done miraculous things or great things with their life. And so the Catholic church or other churches elevated them to sainthood. But, but you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a saint. A saint is not something that, uh, it's not based on anything that I've done. A saint, the word saint means you're called out from the world. It's based solely on what Jesus has done for us. Not by anything that I've done. So I want you to repeat these words after me. If you're a follower of Jesus, say, I am a saint. I am a saint, right? Now, what God says about you says a lot about him. And what I mean by that is he, he literally calls you called out ones. In fact, the church, the Greek word for church in the Bible is the Greek word ekklesia. It means called out ones, we Followers of Jesus have been called out from the pattern of this world. We are no longer sinners saved by grace, right? We're no longer sinners. That's not, that's not who we want to identify as. The Bible calls us saints. We're not going to identify as we are sinners that are saved by grace. That is true. That is a true statement. But words matter. Words are so important. And God calls you a chosen one. He calls you a saint. He calls you called out ones. Now, we're going to learn a new word today. I want you to repeat it after me. Say this. Say, I am a masterpiece. I am a masterpiece. God calls us this in this chapter, chapter 2. He calls you and me masterpieces. Now, I've got to be honest with you. Sometimes I don't feel like a masterpiece. In fact, sometimes I feel like a color by numbers type of guy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, I brought one, so to speak. <laughs> I stole this from my youngest daughter's bedroom, and, uh, and in fact, it's, she's colored one page so far, and it's really horrible, so this is not a masterpiece. <laughs> what this represents, she's not in here, don't worry, what this represents, what this represents is potential for sure, right? Potential for a masterpiece that only a father or mother could love, right? That goes up on the fridge. But if I'm honest with you, this is no, nothing more than just a copy, right? It's a lifeless, colorless copy. But that's not who God calls you. He calls you, if you're a follower of Jesus, he calls you a called out one. He calls you a saint. He calls you a masterpiece. Now, I got to be honest, I already said this. Some days I don't feel like masterpiece. I don't, sometimes I feel like more like this copy. There are millions and millions of these books sold at Walmart, Amazon, Costco. They're all the same. And to be honest with you, this is how I used to feel before I met Jesus. Lifeless, colorless, empty, dead. There are millions of these. But God called you to something greater. You were created for more. You are a saint. You are a masterpiece. My first point to you this morning before we step into the passage, just, just remember this, this phrase. The power of remembrance. There is power in your remembering where you came from. There is power in remembering the old life. The old, dead, lifeless, colorless life that we came from. Paul opens up this chapter by saying this. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions 
and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Did you catch that? He said, as for you, as for you, you were dead in your sins, in your transgressions. That's a big word, transgressions. We don't really use that. We don't throw that around very frequently in my normal day-to-day conversations. We don't do that, do we? No, transgression. What is transgression? Transgression means to slip or to fall or to uh, trespass against somebody. So basically what Paul is saying here is you were once dead in your sins and your transgressions. You slipped up with your life. The Bible says that all of us have fallen short of God's glory. All of us have slipped up and have fallen short of what God expects of us. Now, what does God expect of us? Well, God is perfect. He is holy. There's no one like him. The Bible says he's so holy and high and lifted up that even angels are worshiping him at this very moment around the throne of God in heaven. And these angels are shouting out to him, worshiping him. And and the Bible tells us, uh, gives us a glimpse of this moment. This moment where these angels are flying with two wings. They're flying and and with two wings they're covering their feet. And with two wings they cover their eyes because God is so holy they can't truly look upon him. That is a powerful God. That is a holy God. The Bible says that all of us have fallen short of God's glorious expectations. Of perfection. That means even me, your, your beautiful pastor. Hans- I should have said handsome. Your handsome pastor. Your handsome pastor is not perfect. I am far from perfect. If you, wanna, if you want proof of this, go ask my wife. Go ask my kids. I am far from perfect. But I do have someone that stood in my place for me. We'll get to that in a moment. Paul reminds them, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions, the power of remembrance. Remember where you came from. As he writes this to the church in Ephesus, he says, remember where you came from, how low you were spiritually, how dead you were spiritually. The ways in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. I don't know about you, but it feels like for me, as a follower of Jesus, it feels like sometimes the current of our society, the current of our culture, the current of the world is moving fast and it's hard to turn around and to swim against the current. And everybody is swimming with the current, but it feels, feels like, man, I, I know this is wrong. I know God is calling me to something greater. I know he's called me for more. And the current is so strong, but we are called out of that current. We are called not to follow the ways of this world. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air, that's Satan. We sang about Satan falling like lightning. The truth is, Satan, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, he, he loses. You have an enemy out there that is fighting for your attention. Fighting for your spiritual attention. You and I, if we are saints, if we're called out of this world, if we're masterpieces, we are called to swim against that current in culture. Remember how far you've come. He says this, verse 3, he says, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest of the people that are swept up in this mighty, strong current. Like the rest of them, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. Man, that is a powerful thing when you really step back from it all, right? We were all in that current at one time. We were all being swept downstream. And like all of those, we were deserving of wrath. Remember where you came from. The power of remembrance is so powerful. I don't know if that makes sense. The power of remembrance is where we need to stand. The power of remembrance is where we need to fight the good fight. The the power of remembrance is where we need to stand to keep the faith. The power of remembrance is where we stand to run the race that is laid before us, the race of faith. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? You were dead. 
We all know what death means. We all know what a dead body is. But Paul uses this phrase and he says, you were once dead. You were once dead. Just as a person physically dead does not respond to physical stimuli, so a person spiritually dead is unable to respond to spiritual things. That's why when we sing here, it's a powerful moment for us, right? When we raise our hands in signs of surrender, we say, God, you deserve all the glory. You deserve all the praise because you brought me from death to life. Man, that's a powerful statement. That is a powerful thing. So we respond spiritually because we understand what it means. A corpse doesn't hear the conversation going on at a funeral. A corpse has no appetite for food or drink. They feel no pain because they are dead. And the same is true spiritually for the inner being of a person who doesn't know God. They are spiritually dead. They have no life in their spirit. I... I walked an aisle in my church back when I was probably nine, nine years old. I walked the aisle. I made a profession of my faith. I believed that Jesus died on the cross for me. And in that moment, just like that, just like that, I became spiritually alive. Now, the prayer didn't save me. Saying the prayer out loud doesn't save you. It has to be a heart thing. And when I professed with my mouth what I was already believing in my heart, I went from spiritual death to spiritual life. Never will anybody who's come from spiritual death to spiritual life ever go back to spiritual death. If you have a hard time believing that, find someone in Scripture that has gone from spiritual life to spiritual death. I'm sorry, spiritual death to spiritual life and then back to spiritual death. It's not in there. In other words, once you're in the family of God, you're in. Once you are part of the family of God, you are saved. You're once saved, always saved. Now we have a responsibility and there's accountability when we stand before Jesus. Man, I am made new when I professed Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. My spirit came alive. Spiritually dead people, their faculties aren't functioning. And they cannot function until God gives them life. The cause of this spiritual death is trespasses or transgressions of sins to slip and to fall like we all have. The Bible says that nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. The Bible says that we were all created for fellowship with God. We were all created to have a relationship with God. And if you go back to the very beginning of Scripture, we see that Adam and Eve had relationship with God, specifically Adam. Adam had relationship with God. He actually walked with God in the cool of the day, in the Garden of Eden. Some people deny that story to be true, but I'm taking the Bible at its word. I'm saying that's probably true. Think about this. God walking with Adam... That must have been a powerful thing when you think about it. But then the deceiver came in, right? The deceiver, the one who lies. That's his number one tool. He's the deceiver. He lies. He lied to Eve. Adam became passive. He should have stood in the gap between his family and the world. And he should have, he should have told Eve the truth, the, the full word of God. Because before Adam took The bite, before Eve even took the bite, Adam was alone in the garden. And God told Adam to to not eat from that one specific tree. You can eat from any tree in the garden, but just do do not eat from this one tree that's right here. And Adam failed as a man. He failed as a leader in his home. He failed as a protector in his home. I'm guilty of that. Truth be told, I'm guilty of that. Probably most men are. God said, do not eat from this one tree. And then later, God creates Eve from Adam's rib. And it was Adam's responsibility to share what God had told him. It was Adam's responsibility to pour the fullness of God's word into his wife. And so when the tempter, the, 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 the enemy comes, and he tempts Eve, Adam is right there by her side. He said, did God really say? Yes, God did say. Did God really say that you shouldn't eat from this tree? And she said, well, we shouldn't eat it or touch it because we might die. That's not what God said. God said, do not eat this tree. Do not eat from the fruit of this tree. And they slipped and they fell. Men, 
It's up to you and I. It's up to us to lead our families, to protect our families well. To pour the truth of God's word into their lives. You see, when we fall to sin, we were created for relationship with God, but we have fallen to sin. We're the ones that have made a mess. We're the ones that have fallen short of what God had expected. But God loved you enough to provide a way out. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. In other words, death is payment for your sin. Now, what is death? Death is separation physically, right? As the spirit without the body is dead, the body is dead without the spirit. So is the uh, faith without works. We'll get into that some other day. But it's separation. Death is separation, not only physically, for those who don't know Jesus, those who don't have a relationship with him. It's also spiritually. Death, separation spiritually for the non-believer is their payment for sin. That's where I was headed. That's where you were headed. Remember where you came from. Remember where we came from. We came from the lowest of lows and God reached down and pulled us up. You know, God loves you. I want you to hear this. God loves you. He loved Adam and Eve. And so he loved them too much to let them just stay in that state of decay or, or spiritual separation from him. So you know what he did? He took an animal and killed that animal and provided clothing for them. We don't know what kind of animal it was, but he made skins of clothing for them because they realized once they had sinned, they realized their eyes were open, their spiritual eyes were open. And they realized they were naked. And God provided a way for them to be healed, to be made new. He forgave them. For the non believer, the non believer is not sick, the non believer is dead. The non believer doesn't need resuscitation, he needs a resurrection. Think about that for a moment. The non-believer who has no relationship with God is not just sick. Paul calls that person that's not a believer dead. They don't need to be resuscitated. They need to be raised back to life. You see, sin is against me. But God is for me. Sin is against you. But God is for you. Listen to this. In verse 4, he says, because of his great love, because of God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, he's wealthy in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions, even when we've slipped up and have fallen. He's made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. That is a powerful statement. Maybe you grew up in a church where you were uh, expected to do certain things to have relationship with God. The Bible says that, no, it's not by anything that you do. It's by everything that he's already done for you. It's by grace you've been saved. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. In other words, it's something you receive that you didn't deserve. I deserve death. I deserve spiritual separation from God for all eternity. But he loved me. He's rich in mercy. He gave me something I didn't deserve. He had compassion on me. That's what the word mercy means. He gave me favor when I didn't deserve it. Because he loved me. You know, it's not his love. It's not his love alone that saved me. It's his grace, his mercy. It takes us from being a dead copy to a masterpiece. Brings us from death to life. Look at verse 6. It says, And God raised up, he raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. What this is pointing to is that you and I have a future with Jesus. This life is not the end. When we, when we take our final breath here, our first breath is going to be in heaven. Not only that, Jesus will be enthroned as the king of kings someday. He's not there yet, but someday he will be fully glorified. He will be king of kings, lord of lords. And because of God's grace, because of his great mercy, because he was rich in mercy, and because of his grace, he gave us what we did not deserve. He gave us forgiveness. He gave us, gave us forgiveness of sins. 
and he gave us a purpose. After this life is over, we get to be with Jesus. We get to sit with him. Copies don't get to sit with Jesus. Masterpieces get to sit with Jesus, and this is what he calls you. He's called you out of this world to become a masterpiece. Look at verse 7. We will be seated with Christ in the heavenly realms in order that the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. In the ages to come, your story will be told. Those of us who follow Jesus, those of us who listen to where he's leading us, those of us who let Jesus work in and through us, those testimonies, those stories will be told for generations to come. Those stories in heaven will be told for ages to come. You see, there's a work going on inside of us right now. God's work in us is what this is talking about. God's work in us right now, right here, this moment. The Bible says in first, uh, I'm sorry, in Philippians 1, 6, it's not on the screen, but listen to this. It says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. What he's begun in you already, he's carrying on to completion. We're not quite there yet, right? But we're better than we used to be. Maybe some days you don't feel like a masterpiece, but guess what? We can take these steps one at a time until we're closer and closer to him. The Bible says if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. That's what he says. Now, sometimes I feel like the old me. I feel like the old me dead, right? The, the dead me, the old copy. But I've been saved by grace. I want to read this passage to you. Because we're talking about baptism coming up in the next few weeks. I just want, I want, to, I want to share this thought with you. Romans chapter 6. It won't be on the screen. Just listen to this. Paul writes to this, this church in Rome and he says, What shall we say then? Because of God's grace for us, should we go on sinning that God's grace should increase? He says, by no means. By no means. We should not continue to live in the old ways. We had set free from sin. He says, by no means. We were those who have died to sin. How can you live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from, from, dead, from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Let me just break this down for you. When, when we celebrate baptisms in a few weeks, it's, it's a great a great celebration. Our church loves baptisms. And listen, baptism doesn't save you. There are churches out there that talk about you have to believe, you have to confess your sins, you have to repent, you have to be baptized. There are sacraments maybe that you have to follow. You, you know, you can't miss certain things. You got to come to church or whatever. The Bible says there's only one way to the Father, and it's through Jesus. Baptism is an outward expression, an outward expression of what's already happened on the inside. When someone, when a, when a non-believer comes from spiritual death to spiritual life, here's what happens. What we're saying in that moment, I came from death to life. I was dead, but now I'm made alive. In fact, the old me is now dead because I'm a new creation. So when someone professes faith in Jesus, what they're saying is, I want to identify with Jesus' death on the cross. Because he took my place. When he took my place on the cross, he took on my sin, he took on... The whole world's sin. The Bible says when sin is present, something has to die. In the old days, they used to take animals to the temple to be sacrificed. Jesus was the final sacrifice once for all. That those who believe in him, those who put their trust in him, those who put their faith in him would not perish, would not die, would not be separated from God for all eternity, but would have eternal life right here, right now. Beginning right here, right now. So when someone believes and they profess their faith in Jesus, what they're saying is, I am a, I'm identifying with Jesus' death on the cross. If you know the story, they took Jesus' body off the cross. They buried him in the tomb. When someone goes under the water in baptism, what we're saying is we're identifying with Jesus' death. I'm no longer going back to the old way. His burial. I'm no longer going back to the old way. That old me I'm putting to rest, it's buried. 
And when the person comes out of the water at Baptism Sunday, the, when, when, when the person comes out of the water, they're, they're identifying with Jesus' resurrection. That is a powerful resurrection. For those of us who believe in Jesus, Paul talks about this. He says, for we have been united with him in a death like, the, like his. If we've been united with, a, with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. That means death is not the end. Just as Jesus was raised to life on the third day, we too will be raised to life. If we died with Christ, we believe that he will also live, we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Man, that is a powerful statement. Jesus died and was raised back to life on the third day. Death no longer has mastery over him. He died once, not twice. That means when anybody follows Jesus, what we're celebrating in Baptism Sunday is sin no longer has mastery over this believer who's coming from death to life, buried with Christ, raised to walk in a new life. Man, that is a powerful image. And I don't know if that stirs your heart this morning, but to think about the, the fact that we also get to experience that resurrection. Paul just said it. He said if we've died with him in a resurrection or in a burial like his, we will also be raised to life like he was. Now let me just pause just for a moment and explain to you the burial process in the Old Testament. What they used to do with bodies, when someone would die, they would take that dead body, they would wrap it in strips of linen, like a mummy, from the feet all the way up to the neck. And then they would wrap some kind of cloth, like a towel, around the head. And they would let that body decay in a tomb. You could go visit that body. Usually there was a big stone that was rolled in front of this, this entrance that was carved out into a little cave. That's where they would put the body in this little cave. That's what they did with Jesus. They took his body off the cross. They wrapped him in strips of linen, myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds worth of material. It hardened like a cast around his body. They wrapped a towel around his head. They laid him in the tomb. They rolled a stone in front of it. In fact, they did not want his disciples to come steal the body of Jesus. So you know what the Roman soldiers did? The, the Roman guards that were there, there were probably at least 66 Roman guards standing guard there at the tomb of Jesus. Because they thought that his followers would come in and steal his body and claim that he was resurrected. The Roman soldiers put a spike in the wall in both ends of this rolling stone. They ran a rope across it and sealed it so it was not able to be opened from the outside or the inside. Three days pass. Three days pass. An angel appears at the tomb. These Roman soldiers who are big, strong men, trained killers, they run away. Some of them faint. They run away, scared to death. And the angel rolls the stone away with such great force, with such great power that the spike on one of the ends of the wall is sheared off into the wall. I've actually been there. I've actually seen this spike that's in the wall. It's still there to this day. What they see inside, if you were there in that moment, what you would see inside is empty grave clothes. A shell of what used to be the body of Jesus, wrapped in strips of linen, myrrh and aloes, that had hardened like a cast around the body of Jesus. It was standing there. It was, uh, the, John says when they got to the tomb, the grave clothes were standing by themselves. The towel that was wrapped around his head had folded up on itself. Jesus was raised just like that. New body, immediately. Never to die again. Man, you compare that with Lazarus. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, Lazarus comes out waddling out of the tomb. And Jesus says to those standing by, help him take off the grave clothes. Help him take off that, that which is binding him to death. And i got to be honest with you this morning, some of us, some of us have been set free from slavery to sin. Some of us have been set free from death. But some of us don't remember how far God has brought us. In fact, some of us haven't even stepped outside the tomb. I'm coming out of the grave. I don't want to go back in the, in, in, the, in the grave. 
And listen, those of us that are in charge of people leading groups, those of us who are leaders in this church are charged with helping people loose the grave clothes, take the grave clothes off of them to help them find freedom. Paul continues, Jesus' work on the cross is fully completed for you and me. Listen to this. Paul continues in Ephesians 2, verse 8. It is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. What Jesus did on the cross for you, his death, his burial, his resurrection, gives you and me hope that death is not the end. He completed it fully. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to die on the cross for you, but you got to live a good life. You see, Jesus didn't come to die on the cross for you, to make you a good person. He came to bring you from death to life. In other words, let me say it this way. God didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. But so many of us find ourselves still wrapped up in the grave clothes. We've got to break free of that, right? Because we've been set free by the power of Jesus. You know, with everything that's going on in our world, God's work in and through us is so important. If we tap into that, God wants to move in and through you. God's work in and through you is something we need to tap into. I am saved with a purpose. You are saved with a purpose. You are set aside to do something holy. You know, with everything going on in the world, since 2020, the world has been turned upside down. Let's face it, it has been. Culture is moving faster and swifter than ever before. This current of culture is moving and moving fastly. But if there's any hope, I'm hoping this. I don't know if you've been keeping up with Asbury, uh, Asbury Revival or not, but uh, I'm hoping this. As we look back in history, in the 1960s, political polarization existed. There was a sexual confusion, a sexual revolution, drug overdoses, wars and rumors of wars, of nuclear disaster. Then the Jesus movement sparks and spreads like wildfire. In 2020, there's political polarization, sexual confusion, drug overdoses, wars and rumors of nuclear disaster. I'm praying, Lord, let the revival begin now. If you're here living in Denver, you are living in a mission field. The Bible says that you were created for more. You were created for relationship, but you can't just keep that to yourself. He wants to work in and through you. For those of us that live here in this mission field, you may go, what do you mean? This is not a mission field. There's big churches everywhere. There's Flat Irons, there's Red Rocks, there's Livingstone Church, right? There's all these churches. Listen, did you realize that our community right here in Broomfield is 94% unchurched? That means if you pull up to a red light and there's nine other cars there, you're probably the only believer. We're living in a mission field. The Asbury Revival should not cause believers to sit back and watch to see what happens. It should drive us deeper into desperate prayer for God to do even more in this generation. If I've learned anything about movements of God, the spiritual battle gets more and more intense. But what's happening in in Kentucky, maybe you're out of the loop. There's a big revival going on. For the past 11 days, there's been college students meeting, worshiping, Praying, confessing sin, coming to faith in Jesus on a college campus, nonstop praise and worship, nonstop confessing of sin, nonstop. All of these things are happening for the past 11 days, and it's spreading across the nation. Now, this is nothing new. There's been sparks of revivals going on on college campuses. It's not been as, as highlighted as this recently, but I believe that our kids' generation is the revival generation. And it's up to you and me to raise up disciples, to fight the good fight. They're already fighting things that you and I never had to deal with. What an honor that is, though. To think that we get to lead the the revival generation. We want to see a movement sparked right here in Denver that spreads across the West Coast. And it can happen. And it can happen fast. Did you know that the West Coast, the Western U.S., the Mountain and Pacific time zones have never seen a movement of God before? 
What if this is the time? What if you were created for more at a time such as this to to have a hand in the revival? If you took the mountain and Pacific time zones and made it its own country, it would be the fourth largest lost country in the world next to China, India, and Indonesia. The western U.S. is a mission field. Denver is a mission field. Your neighbors, your neighborhood, your workplace. You were created for more. Every week we see people confess sin right here in this room. Every week we see people worshiping God. Every week we see somebody, either one or two people, every single week come to faith in Jesus right here in this room. God is up to something big. Since we started this church six and a half years ago, 408 people have prayed to receive Christ. That's a big deal. I don't know if you heard me. Let me say it again. 408 people. Come on. You see, you were saved with a purpose. You were saved to let God use you, work through you, become part of what he's doing. But look at verse 10. He says this, and we'll wrap up. He says, for we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God had prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, we're not saved by anything we do. We're saved by the blood of Jesus on the cross. It's not anything I've done. It's everything he's done. He's done all the work. But he's inviting me to to join him in his activity in a movement that we believe is going to change lives over the next few years. You are God's masterpiece. That word masterpiece is the Greek word Poema, which is where we get the word poem from. God is writing your story now. He's writing your story. Your story's not over. As long as I have life in these lungs, man, I'm going to talk about Jesus. I'm going to talk about what he's doing in my life. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never experienced this relationship with God. Maybe for you, church was just a religious duty that you always thought you had to go to to be a good person. I'm here to tell you that church is a place where we join together with like-minded brothers and sisters and worship God and thank Him for what He's done and to hear from His Word and be encouraged to walk out of these doors and into our week and to make an impact in this place. You see, we have relationship. Those of us who have accepted Jesus as our personal Savior, we have relationship with Him. Maybe you're here today and you've never truly had relationship with God. I'm here to tell you, God loves you. He created you. He knows you. He wants you to know him. And right now, you have an opportunity to know him. I want to ask you to do this. We do this every week at the Living Stone. With everybody bowing their heads, closing their eyes, I want to invite you into a time of prayer with me. If that's you and you're ready to have relationship with God, you can pray a simple prayer. Prayer is just talking to God. So as you pray, say something like this. Say, God, I, I want to know you. Say, God, I believe you love me. Tell him that. Say, God, I believe you love me. God, I, I know I have fallen short. I know I've slipped up in this life. I know I've fallen short of what you expect. But God, right now, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sin. God, forgive me of all the things that I've done wrong against you. I believe, tell him, say, I believe that you died on the cross for me, that that you gave your only son for me, Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross. I believe that you raised him back to life on the third day. Would you thank him for that? Say, thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Now, if you just prayed that prayer, I want to tell you something really powerful. If you just prayed that prayer, you are now in relationship with God. He considers you a child. You get to know. If you just prayed that prayer, would you do me a favor? Would you raise your hand where I can see it? No one's looking around. Just raise your hand where I can see it. Anybody pray that prayer? Raise it high where I can see it. Thank you. 
Anyone else? If you prayed that prayer and you were too shy to raise your hand, no worries. Come find us after church. We'll be in the lobby. Scan that QR code. You can tell us on, online there. The Bible says when any one person confesses their sin, when any one person believes that Jesus died on the cross for them, there's such a rejoicing going on in heaven. There's a party going on in heaven. It's a big deal. Can we just give it up for those who are brave enough to pray that prayer today? Father, we're so grateful that you called us out of this world to live a life more like Jesus, to become more like him. Father, help us to do that this week. We love you. Thanks for joining us today. Just wanted to invite you. Don't stop there. Subscribe to this channel for future messages. Connect with us on social media, or if you're ever in the area physically, come join us for a live service. We'd love to have you, celebrate you. We believe that the best is yet to come. And in 2023, God's going to do something incredible for you. I would say that giving changed my world because it's just given me a perspective um, that things are temporary. Um, I think I've gotten used to viewing money or objects as temporary. I think it's just allowed me to live more open-handed with everything I have. <laughs> it. I get less frustrated at children when they destroy things that we have um, than I probably would if I was putting any kind of hope into those items. I think that giving and, and generosity has impacted me uh, at the heart, um, that, that giving of our time, or our talents, or our treasures, it may not seem like what I have to give is very, very much, but, but when I give it, I don't always get to see what it changes, but I know that it changes me. When I, yeah, live open-handedly, and, and everything I have is ultimately God's. So really, I'm just giving it back to him.